Did everyone manage to download the app? Everyone that's looking to take part in the quiz? So what I kind of wanted to really talk about was um, making sure that everyone's aware of how common is mitral valve disease, how often are you expecting to see it. Um, and then later what we'll do is we'll illustrate sort of the management of both preclinical and, and clinical mitral valve disease as well. Um, and then talk about those really difficult that cases, those cases that seem to be bouncing back every couple of seconds. Um, and what options are out there for those patients as well. Um, and then finally, um, Time, time permitting, we'll talk about kind of what's our next steps, where are we moving to with the management of, of mitral valve disease as well. So uh, this is the time, if you haven't joined already, to, to join us um, in the portal. Um, so Chris L399, Brigitte, yours is 400, not 399. Um, just, we're going to get Brigitte's separate opinion and um, ask her throughout, throughout in a second. Okay, so. Okay. So we have a mixture, a mixture of um, answers. So um, actually, um, a, few, a few changes, last minute changes on there too. So um, what we've got is a mixture of people, um, but what's quite interesting is actually it's the most common disease that we see in the UK. Uh, it's the most common cardiac disease um, amongst dogs, and it makes up about 75% of all the work that we will do. So there's a high prevalence. If you see a dog with a heart murmur, um, the, high, the high likelihood is it's gonna be mitral valve disease. And that's kind of why, uh, why we kind of have this topic tonight, is that it's the most common thing you're gonna see, uh, and it's the thing that's gonna bring in uh, a lot of your cases that have heart disease and just managing those patients correctly as well and, and kind of giving them kind of the best treatment that's out there based on what we know um, so far. So it counts for about 75% of all disease. Cavaliers, slightly different group, they have this very long preclinical phase, longer than most dogs. Um, so we typically think of the preclinical phase of mitral valve disease lasting between two and three years. Sometimes in the Cavaliers it can be up to five years. Um, now, not every dog that has preclinical heart disease is actually going to progress. That's another important thing to remember, is that we see a lot of dogs, like your little terrier dogs, that might have a murmur throughout life, but actually don't go on to get congestive heart failure. So it's kind of working out how we are, how are we going to manage these dogs. Um, the nice thing about mitral valve disease is that the loudness of the murmur correlates to the severity of the leak of the valve. So if you have a very loud murmur, that valve is going to be very leaky. If it's a very quiet murmur, that valve is not going to be very leaky. It may make no hemodynamic compromise at all. Um, but one exception is when you have a mitral valve prolapse. So when all of a sudden the two valves are doing very different things, you can end up with a huge amount of regurgitation that's very eccentric. So rather than coming centrally through the mitral valve, it's going off to one side. And typically it will shoot towards the free wall, so towards the chest wall. Um, and it will shoot sort of the chest wall and you'll hear a very loud murmur, sometimes grade five, even grade six. Um, and we had a dog at LVS not so long ago that you could hear the murmur just in the room with the dog, with the room nice and quiet. And I didn't really believe the owner in the consult, but then we went, took it downstairs and we were listened to it in the, in the echo room, I was like, actually, you can hear this moment. I think I've got a recorder on my phone as well, that moment that we heard there. Um, and the last is the key point, that only a third of dogs are ever going to progress to congestive heart failure. So not every dog is going to get congestive heart failure. <coughs> so my next question for, um, for you um, is coming up in a second. Um, one of the key things to remember is your Cavaliers. We said they're a separate group of dogs. They do things differently to your, your other dogs with mitral valve disease. So about 90% of dogs over the age of 10 that are Cavaliers um, have mitral valve disease. It may not be audible, but it will be there. Um, and pretty much every dog, every dog in the population, if we scanned every, um, every elderly dog, we would find mitral regurg in all those dogs as well. It's not to say they will need treating, but it's there. It's certainly very prevalent. Um, males more commonly affected than females, true across all breeds, um, and more commonly it's going to be your mitral and not your tricuspid valve. So your mitral valve is affected in two thirds of cases and your tricuspid valve is affected in about a third of cases. So my next question for you, what percentage of dogs with heart failure secondary to mitral valve have a grade 2 murmur? So you've got the option of um, 0, 5, 10, and So we have a whole mixture, a, a wide spread here, 0, 5, 10, 15%. 
The answer actually is zero. Um, no dog, no dog with mitral valve disease that has a grade two murmur will have congestive heart failure unless you've done it to the dog. Um, so if you overload, if you volume overload a dog with lots of fluids, potentially they have a mitral valve disease, they may develop congestive heart failure. Um, but this was a really nice study that was done. Um, and just to kind of illustrate it for you here, um, we have the various stages of um, mitral valve disease, the Bs being the preclinical phases and the Cs being the clinical phases. Uh, and so you can see in clinical mitral valve disease, um, a few dogs have a grade three murmur. Most of those dogs are gonna have a grade four murmur and the majority um, are going to have a thrill. So that's kind of, um, that's quite interesting information because if you hear a grade two murmur and the dog is tachypnic, it's most likely not cardiac. It's going to be something else. <coughs> assuming that we're talking about mitral valve disease and we're thinking about small or medium size um, adult, adult dogs. When we get to stage B2, it's a lot less clear. So in the preclinical phases, you can see there's a whole variety. Uh, we might see thrills, we might hear loud murmurs, uh, we might even get sort of just a very quiet murmur, but you can see there's a large proportion that might have a grade five or a grade six murmur that are still preclinical. So we can't just go on the grade of the murmur to decide do we treat a dog or not, because we're gonna be over treating a lot of dogs. Um, one of the interesting things here you can see is with a soft murmur, a zero chance of having um, a zero chance of having congestive heart failure. Um, if you have a, a grade two murmur, uh, there's a 90% chance you've got even got B1 disease, so really, really early preclinical disease. So it's quite interesting. These are all going to go online, so you'll actually have access to this. Um, it's all going to go onto the portal, so <coughs> you'll be able to access these if you wanted uh, any more data from from the slides. What um, has happened very recently is that we now have some really good guidelines as well. So the ACVIM committee, um, which is made up of um, both uh, members from the UK, but also from the States, have come together, and Japan, um, have come together um, to kind of give us some guidelines, which are really handy. So we have these for dilated cardiomyopathy, we have these for mitral valve disease, and we will have these for congenital heart disease as well. Um, and in fact, there is some already for kind of the management of murmurs. I think guidelines are really great things. It's kind of what humans have. Um, e you know, even in uh, hospitals, there's very strict guidelines, there's very strict criteria, and it helps to kind of unify patient, um, patient management. And this is a really great document. It's free online, um, and a lot of what we're going to be talking about kind of comes from the new data, because um, this was only just recently updated after a 10-year hiatus between, between the guidelines. So we were talking about um, asymptomatic versus symptomatic. So very simply put, um, if, you're un if you're B2 or less, then you're asymptomatic. If you're C or above, you're symptomatic. If you go to C, you can never really go back. Once you're a C, you're always a C, even if you're very well managed. Um, so you kind of go forward in the phases. Um, you can't really step backwards, um, technically. So my next question, at what stage are we going to start treating mitral valve disease? Which it can be a little bit of a, um, a controversial question. So we'll see what people say. I guess the controversial thing is I said treatment, I've not said medications as well. Um, so I'm going to put this question to Brigitte. At what stage is treatment first indicated? So I would start chemo with the stage B2, and uh, I would start congestive vascular treatment, so clozomide and potentially benazepil, phenylaxin with stage C. Okay. Um, and ACE inhibitors, you'd leave those to stage C? I would. Okay. Uh, mainly, probably mainly because of the cost, and because so far there is like there is some evidence, but it's questionable. We'll come back to that one. So, um, so I guess based on what we already know, um, based on what's out there in the literature, based on kind of the evidence, the evidence that we have, um, and not using just personal opinion, then at the moment, I guess what Brigitte said is correct, that we would um, be given pimabendin at stage B2, all the other medications would wait until they're in congestive heart failure. Um, so moving on to our first patient here, this is Poppy, uh, seven-year-old cavalier, female, um, seven years old, so we're already thinking 50% of cavaliers by this stage are going to develop to murmur. Um, the interesting thing for her is she had a murmur notice two years ago. Um, she's come back in because the murmurs increased in intens intensity. Initially it was grade two, um, and um, so there's been some exercise intolerance as well. She's a little bit portly, um, so she's seven out of nine body condition score as well. Um, in terms of physical exam, the big thing that we've got here is that she has now got a grade five murmur. We said it's originally grade two. Um, her heart rate's 120 and her respiratory rate in the consult is 40. Um, the, there's a powerful fill on the right hemithorax with widely radiating murmur, uh, no crackles and auscultation. Um, so 
the question is, well, what do you do next with this dog? So we've got the presentation, we've got the clinical exam, we've got these findings as well. So what are you going to think about next? So it just makes it a bit easier to see the answers there. So radiographs, echo, send the dog home, nothing, there's no signs of heart failure, treatment, um, or check NT pro BNP. <coughs> And this is another controversial question. And if you asked a rheumatologist cardiologist what they would do, it would depend on it would depend a lot on kind of owner preference here. So let's see what people have come up with. So what would you do next? Radiographs, we have 23% thinking about radiographs, echo in 73%, send the dog home and ask them to monitor rest and respiratory rate, or nothing, there are no signs of congestive heart failure. Um, nobody's gone for E, no one's gone for, for F. So radiographs would be something to think about. I guess the rationale for radiographs are that we could assess the murmur. We could also assess for other things at the same time. Echo totally makes sense. This dog has a grade five murmur. We're saying that in terms of kind of the likelihood, this dog could well have stage B2 disease, might well need to have treatment. Um, but this dog doesn't have signs of congestive heart failure. This dog doesn't have, um, this dog hasn't got anything on auscultation that makes us think that it's in heart failure. The respiratory rate's 40, which probably in the, in the consult is fairly, fairly normal. Um, and so there's the option here of sending the dog home as well. Now, I guess what we would normally say is in, in days gone by when we didn't know about the fact that we could start preclinical treatment, I think it would have been reasonable to say, well, your dog isn't in heart failure, probably go home and we'll wait until he is. But now with what we know, probably further investigations is the way to go. Um, so thinking about doing further investigations. Um, and what we've got here is a split between x-rays and, and echo. I guess for me, um, echo is probably the worst, the first thing that I would do, just because I can assess both lungs and hearts with, with ultrasound. Um, and I'm quite a big fan of doing like TFASTs, and we get a lot of information from that as well. Um, I think radiographs are also useful as well, and we'll come back to kind of the, the utility of the radiographs too. What would you do? So we did. We did radiographs. Um, so we started off with radiographs. But the question is, are they, are they essential? Um, and I think there's an argument to say radiographs aren't always essential. When, uh, when we're thinking about managing mitral valve disease, we have to remember that not every dog is going to get heart failure and not every coughing dog with a murmur has heart, heart failure. We need to think about why we're doing the radiographs. So if I have a patient that comes to me that's coughing with a loud murmur, the echo is going to tell me about the heart. The radiographs are going to tell me about the lungs, and if it's pulmonary edema, the echo might also tell me about pulmonary edema as well. But if it's bronchial disease, I'm not going to see that on my echo. So radiographs and, and radiographs and echo probably go hand in hand. Um, obviously, I didn't put that as an option. So for some people that would have chosen both, that's probably not very fair. Um, but the nice thing about the radiographs is also kind of calculating risk. So from the radiographs, we can look for pulmonary venous distension. We can kind of look at this cranial lobar bronchus here. We can look at the, the artery and the vein, compare them between each other and sort of see if one's bigger than the other. So if your, if your ventral vessel, so your, your pulmonary vein is greater in size than your pulmonary artery, which runs above it, above the bronchus, then that's kind of an indicator of pulmonary venous distension. That's kind of heralding the kind of increased pressure in the, in the pulmonary venous system and then the likelihood of developing pulmonary edema. We can look for cardiomegaly, so we can do a vertebral heart sum, so we can do the kind of the traditional one where you go from the apex to base and then across bisecting, um, or there's a new one called the vertebral heart sum for assessing atrial size as well, so VLAS. Um, and so normal is less than three vertebrae, and it's from the carina to the back of the, the, back of the atrium. Um, this is a useful measurement as well, So because you're looking purely at left atrial enlargement, you're not looking at globoid, um, globoid cardiomegaly. So um, it's a new thing to consider, to consider measuring as well. And anything over three is considered dilated. But the nice thing is that we can assess for other disease, other lung disease. That's kind of the key thing. And I think for lots of these small breed dogs that come in with a loud murmur and coughing, radiographs would be a reasonable thing to do, um, as, would, as would echo. Um, but we did echo this patient as well. And this is kind of what we saw on, on the echo. Um, so here we have our four chamber view, um, left atrium, left ventricle, mitral valve here, typical mitral valve disease of a cavalier. This left ventricle to me looks slightly rounded. So I look at it and think, mm, subjectively that's a rounded left ventricle. This left atrium perhaps is a little bit big too. Uh, you know, this whole left heart is probably taking up three quarters of the screen. Um, and our little right ventricles up here is taking up maybe a quarter. So thinking, is there, is there any change there? 
when we put the colour on over the valve, we get lots of regurgitant flow, so kind of lots of aliasing of flow through the mitral valve. Uh, we've diagnosed this dog has mitral valve disease. Um, the question then is, well, are we going to treat it? Are we going to start this dog on treatment? And that comes down to two very important criteria. One is going to be the size of your left ventricle. So looking at this left ventricle on your M mode, if you've got M mode on your machine, um, and then looking at the left ventricular internal dimension in diastole. So effectively looking at the largest volume um, or largest dimension of your left ventricle. Um, and then that can be plugged into a formula. Um, and this formula is very handy because it takes a, takes a number and takes the weight and it tells you whether that's normal or not. <coughs> And so what's, what's sort of come out from studies is that if that number is, o is over 1.7, uh, then we are thinking that they're meeting criteria for treatment. If it's under 1.7, they are not yet meeting treatment criteria. So here, um, even though Poppy looks a little bit dilated, she still has a left ventricle that's within normal limits, 1.65. The other thing that we also have to measure, as well as that left ventricle, is the left atrium as well. And we're going to measure that at the heart base. So we're going to be at the level of the left atrium and the, um, and the aorta. So when we look at that particular measurement, uh, we're taking a measurement across the, across the aorta from internal lumen to internal lumen, and then across the left atrium from the internal lumen of the left atrium to the, to the far field of the left atrium as well. And again, when we actually take these and look at the measurements, these measurements are both normal. So both are under the criteria, so normal, less than 1.6, totally normal. By, by definition, she has no evidence of cardiomegaly on, um, on echo. She didn't have cardiomegaly on radiographs. And when we're looking at cardiomegaly on radiographs, the other important thing to say is that the changes that you need um, on radiographs to see change on the radiographs compared to the echo is, is there's a bit of a difference. So you're going to get you're going to see changes on your echo sooner than you will on your radiographs. If you wait for cardiomegaly on radiographs, often you're much further along in B2. So you're going to pick up your B2 dogs much earlier with echo than you will do with, with radiographs. Um, so it, stage B1, no therapy indicated. There's no kind of the recommendations for, for patients with stage B1 is uh, there are no treatments. Uh, the rec one of the recommendations is that they should be um, considered to be excluded from breeding uh, because they've got, they've got some early mitral valve disease. Um, if there are large breed dogs, we treat them slightly differently too. So any dog that's kind of over 15 kilos uh, would be considered to be a larger, a medium to large breed dog. And medium and large breed dog mitral valve disease follows a very different pattern. So we talked about mitral valve disease having this nice long preclinical phase that goes on for years. If you're a large breed dog, if you're a Labrador, a Collie, if you're a German Shepherd, um, then all of those dogs that get mitral valve disease, uh, they can also get mitral valve disease with systolic dysfunction. They're a little bit on the fence. I'm a bit of mitral valve, I'm a bit dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, and they have a much more rapid progression of their condition. So they go through the stages of mitral valve disease much faster than the smaller breeds. So the recommendations then for those B1 dogs is that we should probably reevaluate them in six to 12 months. Um, so we often will say six months if it's the first time that we've seen them and potentially 12 months um, if, if, it's, if it's a dog that we've seen once already. And this all comes from, from the EPIC study. So where these numbers came from when we said, well, the left atrium is less than 1.6, the left ventricle, based on body weight normalised, um, was 1.7. Our, our values were under that for Poppy. And this is a really great study to kind of show, actually, if you start a pimabendin in that preclinical phase, um, which is sort of new, new data for us, uh, that that will actually extend the preclinical period. So it kind of gives you an extra 15 months before you would go on to develop congestive heart failure. So um, this is kind of our take home really from, from that study. Um, I think before this study came out, the cardiologists were probably doing this already. Um, and this sort of has just helps to confirm that, you know, that this is the right way to go for, for treatment of, of small breed dogs. Um, another just important thing is that it was sponsored by the drug company that produced the, <laughs> produced the drug as well. Um, but it was a very well scrutinized study actually. So um, it, had, it, was very, it was very well scrutinized. And actually it was stopped early because there was this clear diversion of the two lines and it was considered unethical not to treat um, when they kind of did their interim analysis. So quite a powerful, powerful study. It's actually the best study that veterinary medicine has to date um, in terms of it being prospective and blinded as well. Um, so one of the things that comes from that then, if we're seeing this clear survival advantage is, should we just not be treating everybody? Um, should we not just be reducing everybody's risk? And I think it depends on whether you're going to follow an evidence base or not, which is why I was asking Brigitte the question earlier on. Um, should we be treating any dog with mitral valve disease murmurs? 
And I think the answer probably is, is no. Um, depends how deep your back pocket is, but um, I think the, probably the, the ethical answer is no. Um, only a third of those dogs that get mitral valve disease that are either B1 or B2, um, or, or, sorry, only that are B1 are going to develop onto B2 and then stage C. So we have to remember two thirds of dogs with mitral valve disease are never gonna progress. Um, and that actually 80% of dogs can live over six years with mitral valve disease. So these are really good statistics. Um, we, we need to make sure we pick out the right population, we treat the right population, otherwise uh, you know, we're gonna be over treating. Um, and so currently kind of the, the bottom line is that there is no evidence that we should start treatment at stage B1, but we should be thinking about <coughs> it at stage B2. When we get to stage B2, uh, then it starts to become a little bit more, this is taken straight from the guidelines. So when you see kind of a little recommendation here, this is what's recommended in the guidelines. Um, so the consensus has to be met for things to be strongly recommended. So on here, only two, um, well, a few of these are kind of strongly recommended. So pimabendin, based on the data we just showed you, um, there is a recommendation to reduce sodium. Um, now, I don't tend to restrict sodium in the patients I see with mitral valve disease. Um, I think, I guess, what I prefer is that these patients maintain body weight. There's a correlation between body weight loss and poor prognosis. Um, so I would rather that dogs are eating the same diet, eating it well, and maintaining body weight. Um, I don't know actually what Brigitte does um, for sodium restriction, if you recommend it to the clients. No, I, I was in a talk and uh, they actually recommended it quite a lot, but I don't tend to, to do it. I prefer them to keep eating rather than stop eating food and no problem. So yeah, I guess so restricting sodium is restricting the palatability of the food as well. That's kind of the thing to just remember with, with sodium restriction. Um, ACE inhibitors, so 50% of the panel decided they would give an ACE inhibitor if there was progressive left atrial dilation. And I guess that's where it gets slightly controversial. So we do occasionally give an ACE inhibitor in the preclinical phase. If I have a dog that I've seen and we're monitoring and they've got progressive left atrial dilation, then we know in the last kind of six months of mitral valve disease, you get quite an exponential increase in the size of your chambers. So if we know that we're seeing that, then we may start ACE inhibitors because um, there is good evidence to say as soon as you start seeing that dilation that your RAS system is activated. So there is theoretical evidence that that may be beneficial. But, um, but there's no good evidence to support it um, in, a clinical, in a clinical trial setting. Actually, there's, been sh there's, no, there's no survival benefit that's been shown in a clinical setting. Spironolactone um, is crossed out here because we were actually really excited um, about a new study that had just sort of been, um, the results have literally just come out in September. Um, and so it's not been peer reviewed yet, but um, there was an idea that perhaps giving patients spironolactone in this B2 phase might extend the preclinical phase. Uh, the data suggests otherwise. The data suggests that whilst the chambers might be smaller, there's no survival advantage. And for me, if there's not really survival advantage, then that's one of the reasons that I don't tend to do things. Um, if there's a clinical benefit, then I would do them as well, but there's no, there's no clinical benefit either. Other things to remember is if these patients are hypertensive, so if they've got high blood pressure, higher, as Brigitte was saying earlier on, higher blood pressure means an increased airflow. That heart has to generate much more pressure to overcome the pressure in the aorta. And so if you have a leaky valve, then that left ventricle that's generating all that pressure is also generating pressure going back to your left atrium. So if the pressure that's generating is high because of high blood pressure, let's drop that blood pressure down and just make sure we've got really good control of, of systemic hypertension. So I think if you're doing um, echoes for dogs with mitral valve disease, it's always important to take a blood pressure hand in hand with that as well. And should they have a cough, um, consider cough suppression um, because lots of dogs can have um, bronchomalacia, um, chronic bronchitis, so consider airway workups as long as you're happy that these dogs don't have congestive heart failure. So those would be the recommendations from, from the panel, from the ACM, ACBM guidelines. So next question for you here. So how do you manage a dog with mitral valve disease that has historical heart failure, a respiratory rate of 16, but is still coughing? And this is kind of one of the cases that we're starting to get to those more um, frustrating cases to try and manage. So our options are to increase the furosemide, add spironolactone, stop the ACE inhibitor, add um, codeine, add antitussives, add bronchodilators. Okay. 
So I should also kind of probably add that we, um, his, for most of our patients that we would treat with heart failure, uh, we would tend to do what we call SPAF them. Um, so we'll give them spironolactone, pimabendin, an ACE inhibitor, and fruzamide. So they'll kind of be on, um, on SPAF for therapy. So I've got some increased fruzamide, add spironolactone, um, stop the ACE inhibitor, add antitussives, add bronchodilators. So I guess a lot of people are thinking that they're going to look at managing airways, which I think is a reasonable, a reasonable thing to do. Um, increasing fruzamide, well, this dog already has a respiratory rate of 16, um, and one of, the, one of the reasons it will be given fruzamide is if we're worried about pulmonary edema. Um, and so a res resting respiratory rate of 16 in a small breed dog with mitral valve disease um, is probably not a dog that needs more fruzamide. Um, I guess what we sometimes will see is fruzamide can dry out airway secretions. It can help with bronchial disease for that reason. And I guess that's one of the other things to mention as well, is that little dogs, little lot of terriers we'll see that come in from murmur checks that have been on fruzamide for seven years um, and still are doing really, really well. Probably when they went onto the treatment, they may have been coughing for another reason uh, and they responded to the fruzamide because of its airway effects and its airway properties, but there may be better airway, pro airway medications to be using. So increased fruzamide, I probably wouldn't, but um, I think add spironolactone is, is, a, is a consideration if this dog had continuing um, signs of heart failure. Add spironolactone is an interesting one. So we have some good data now as well that dogs that go straight into congestive heart failure probably should consider putting them on spironolactone. The evidence that's behind it, um, it's kind of an agreed thing that for stage C dogs, dogs should receive spironolactone. Um, so if it's not already on spironolactone, I'd put it on spironolactone, but not necessarily because of the ongoing <coughs> cough. Um, I've got one for um, stop the ACE inhibitor. Um, so there, there is some evidence in people um, and some anecdotal evidence um, from a few, like from a handful of cases that, um, that people and animals may cough with an ACE inhibitor. So one of the side effects of an ACE inhibitor is that it can cause coughing. I think I've seen it in two dogs. Um, I think whenever you see it, when, or whenever I see it, and I don't really believe it, and I don't know whether it's the owner just kind of um, not, you know, read, read the data sheet too much, is that I'll stop it and then I'll reintroduce it and stop it again. Because um, it's not, the cough is not gonna be, you know, the cough isn't a problem for the dog, and I don't want to stop it if I don't have to. But I've had a new fee, and I've had a Cavalier that have both, um, both been very sensitive to ACE inhibitors. Um, so it's just something to remember that sometimes coughing can be actually related to the drugs we're already on. But I probably would be in this camp here. I'd be thinking about airway, um, airway, di airway dilators or antitussives. Um, but these are really problematic dogs. So um, cough is more commonly associated. So moving on to kind of treatment. So we kind of just illustrated some, um, some features of mitral valve disease. But thinking about um, what we're going to do with these patients, I think Brady grass, as we said before, definitely worth considering. We can look at our vertebral heart score. Um, we can look at pulmonary edema. Um, and we just need to remember that the radiograph is probably better for us when we're thinking that could this cough be heart or, or lung. Echo, we've sort of spoken about it, but one of the other things that we often will see is if you don't have colour Doppler, um, if your machine doesn't have colour Doppler, is that you're looking for these big um, dilated chambers that are still really well contractile. So, um, you know, a dog that has mitral valve disease, even if you can't put colour on that valve, we see this big thick valve, we see a big left atrium, we see a dilated left ventricle, and we see that it's still contracting. And if I didn't have colour, I'd be fairly happy to call it without needing to, needing to prove that there's mitral valve disease. Because this dog probably has a grade four, if not five, murmur based on that size of that chamber. Um, how many people are doing lung ultrasound uh, like as a as kind of a first a first port of call for dyspnea patients? So I think it's a really good thing. I think it's an up and coming tool. And um, you know, I think for us, we probably do this before we reach for a radiograph in a dyspnea patient, um, because it's much easier for us to do this without having to restrain the dog, put sand out, sandbags on the dog, and actually we get a lot of information. So the important thing is, how do you start? Because you've got this tachypnic dyspnea patient in front of you, you don't want to stress it out, but you do want to try and get to the bottom of what's going on. So it's quite a systematic, uh, systematic approach. We go left and right hand side, start in the corded dorsal lung field, work your way to the perihyla region, uh, the mid thorax and then the cranial, cranial chest as well. Um, and the reason we start in the corded dorsal um, is often that's where we're gonna see, um, if we've got pulmonary edema, that's where we're gonna see pulmonary edema. In dogs, 
Typically, pulmonary edema is going to start in your perihilar region and your corded dorsal lung field, so it's a good place to start. It does mean that you've got a few shade patches on the dog, um, but it might save having to do radiographs if, if you see uh, these striations coming down the screen. So these are what we call B lines. Normally, what you'll see is you'll see lots of horizontal lines. So we call these A lines coming across here. Uh, and when you have lines that bisect and almost look like rays of sunshine in a murky pond, uh, with a bit of imagination, then uh, that, those would be our B lines. So that's kind of what we expect to see with, with A lines. And they get worse as disease goes on. So these are all dogs with congestive heart failure. As, progress, as pulmonary edema increases in, in amounts, you'll get more and more B lines. So mild, moderate, severe. Um, and when you get to severe, actually there's so many B lines, there's so much fluid in that lung lobe that they kind of coalesce and it can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. But in a moving picture, you would see that that's all moving backwards and forwards. This is all kind of lung, like artifact in the lung. You can do it with your um, microconvex probe, um, you can do it with your linear probe, um, and if you have a phased array probe for cardiac setting, you can do it with that too. It doesn't matter which probe you have. Um, key thing to remember with uh, B lines is that they're not on their own, they're not definitive for pulmonary edema. Uh, we'll see them with pneumonias and we'll see them with hemorrhage. Um, we might see them with um, drowning. So anything that puts fluid in the lungs is going to give you B lines. Um, but if we see B lines, we have a big heart on, um, on ultrasound of the heart, so TFAS to look at cardiac signs, I would treat that patient without taking it for radiographs. Um, it's sort of just kind of, I think, the way in which uh, kind of triaging that emergency cardiac patient is, is going. I'm going to jump through, just in the essence of time, I'm going to jump through blood pressure. Um, this will be, if you wanted to review it, this will be there um, online. Um, but I just think the important thing is just to remember that not to forget blood pressure. Um, if it's low, treat it. If it's high, treat it. If it's normal, great. Um, how many people do biomarkers for mitral valve disease? How many people are kind of checking biomarkers? So I think for what, it depends on the question that you're asking. So I think there is some really good um, data from biomarkers. One of the nice things is likelihood to develop heart failure within 12 months. So if you have a small breed dog and your, your NT probing P is over 1500, you're likely to develop heart failure in the next 12 months. We can get some similar information from the echo and potentially more. There's no, there's no, core, there's no kind of causal link at the moment between the level of your NT probium P and whether you're stage B1 or B2 or C. Um, but that data is coming and it might be that we start using biomarkers rather than echo to decide if a patient is stage B1 or B2. However, at the moment, probably the most sensitive tool is your echo. Um, so it's, it's useful. Sometimes it helps convince a client to do more investigations, but probably if they're going to spend their money on something for a dog with a murmur, an echo is going to be more useful than the biomarkers. Um, if you are measuring biomarkers, then another nice cutoff that's sort of published is if it's over 1800 picomoles per litre, then those dogs, if they have respiratory signs as well, are much more likely to be um, congestive heart failure with a sensitivity of about 85%. I think specificity is very similar as well. Um, moving um, on to our last set of, of patients, where it starts to get a little bit more challenging um, as they go through these steps here. So moving on to our, our symptomatic patients. No worries. So Jasper, um, this is a dog that I saw as an intern. <clears throat> and I saw him, uh, he came in um, initially, he's one of the vet nurses that I used to work with in my first job. He came, so he came to see us. Um, initially came with no clinical signs, but he had a grade one, two murmur. Um, normal lung sounds, respirate was 28 breaths per minute. Um, and so uh, being a vet nurse, um, having own cavaliers that have crashed and burned in the past, um, she was really worried about this dog. Uh, you know, he's got a great, he's got a great, he's got a grade one, two murmur as well. Um, so the question is, well, what do you do here? So when would you recommend to monitor over investigations? So what would you do with, with that type of patient? So you have a patient with a grade one, two murmur, respiratory rate of 28, normal heart rate, no clinical signs reported by the owner. <coughs> so do some investigations, put your seatbelt on and wait for the ride, um, or do some investigations <coughs> at the bottom. So as we go through this, we've got sort of a mixture of things here. So um, I guess what would you do in this situation, Brigitte? Well, I would say probably I would echo, but uh, if uh, money was a problem, I would probably um, just ask them to monitor the breathing and then come back in six months because it's a soft murmur, so the dog is not showing any clinical signs. 
but most of the time because we had lots of echoing as well so people would have a final diagnosis and then they could see all their legs with the heart beat. Yeah, so I think this comes down to owner. When it's a grade, when it's a grade one two murmur in a in a dog, um, we're th we're really at the beginning of mitral valve disease, with the very early onset. So one of the questions is, well, what do we do with a grade one or a grade two murmur? If the client wants to have it investigated, I think there's no reason not to investigate them. Um, as you could see from the data before, there are no dogs. Uh, there are well, sorry, there are three percent of dogs that have a grade two murmur that will be stage B two. And we've talked about mitral valve disease having this very long, progressive, uh, long clinical, preclinical phase. So these dogs are going to be preclinical for a long time. And so if, if there's only a 3% chance, you think, well, is there any point doing an echo? There's a 3% chance your dog might have mitral valve disease. But hey, this is a slow disease. We could wait another six months. I think it's, it's a reasonable thing if they don't have money. But I also agree with Brigitte that if the owners want to go for echo, then echo is going to give us more information uh, than the NT Pro BMP. Um, but I also think that it's totally reasonable to say, well, we could just get you back in six months, have a listen to your murmur. If it's now grade two, not grade one, two, then maybe that might push us to do an echo. Um, or if it's gone from a two and it's now kind of more two, three or three, then let's see you back and let's do some investigations then. Um, so I think for me, this question comes down to, well, what does the owner want to do? This owner was really worried. She'd had Cavaliers before that had heart failure. She wanted to know. And I think that's a reasonable reason for doing a non-invasive test. Um, but I wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't say that it's absolutely essential in that grade one to two um, murmur. So this was his echo. So we did do it, and this was his echo. <coughs> normal left atrium, just by eyeballing it, the ratio is not going to be over, and normal left ventricle for a cavalier as well, but slightly thickened valve there. So Jasper, we left him cooking for a while. Um, actually seven years, so he was, um, that murmur was seven years later, this dog came back in. Um, we've been seeing him every year, um, the owner's been spending lots of money, um, but it was seven years until he went into heart failure. At this point in time, when I was an intern, was back in 2009, um, and so we didn't have the, the data that we should have started vet medin. This dog didn't start vet medin in the preclinical phase. Um, and so probably we would have seen this dog back um, now with what we know, when that, grade, when that man was grade three or above, we would have got him back in for an echo. Um, but we saw him when he came back with a, a grade four murmur. Heart rate was a little bit faster. His respiratory rate was elevated as well. Crackles and auscultation, kind of all the classical things that you might expect with mitral valve disease. Uh, and this is what we saw. So, um, you know, we have a big, a big cardiac silhouette. Uh, we can see the vessels here have been elevated. I mean, before, uh, when I showed you that, before they were down here, and that's very typical that when that heart gets really big, that cranial lobar um, bronchus and vein gets pushed upwards. So as that trachea rises, oh, as the trachea rises, so do, so do the bronchial, uh, the, the, the bronchi as well. So everything kind of gets elevated there. Um, we have a big tented left atrium, and we just have this really kind of patchy area around the, around the left atrium. So not kind of your clear... Um, clear congestive heart failure. For me, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one this dog has clinical signs, doesn't have <coughs> lovely fluffy patchy, patchy parts of, of mitral valve, of pulmonary edema, uh, and that's kind of the reality, is that not everybody has this lovely beautiful pulmonary edema, um, but we treated him for what we could see here, fluffiness around the, fluffiness around the, um, the perihyla region, clinical signs that were appropriate for what we were thinking. At that point in time we didn't have lung ultrasound, but in, with lung ultrasound we may have seen V-lines as well. Uh, and this was his this was his heart on the DV. So kind of compare the DV to the lateral, um, but um, stonking heart on the um, on the DV. So um, this was the, the kindest picture that I could find um, on online of, of Alex. So Alex is one of the emergency critical care specialists. So as you heard, there's only uh, we come to see cases one day a week, and so with patients that have um, are more critical than that um, that need emergency care, they'll often come via um, the ECC team and the team at Hampstead. Um, and so emergency treatments are often done by this smiling face um, and not these smiling faces um, because um, they just sort of we're not there enough of the time to see the the critical the really critical patients. Um, and I think for me, when I see a patient that's got um, congestive heart failure, we want to optimise their oxygenation, um, but the main thing is we want to get rid of that pulmonary edema. Um, so we're going to kind of probably try and give them IV freezamide if we can. Um, if you're going to give it subcut or IM, there's not a huge amount of difference in terms of the, the rate of uptake. Um, if you could give it IV, there's a faster action of diuresis, um, and it sort of reaches its peak of diuresis slightly faster than the other methods. 
um, and also may have some extra properties that help to take that preload off the heart. So Brigitte sort of talked about if you have uh, a pericardial fusion, you want to kind of load the heart with preload to kind of keep the chamber open. Now we're trying to get rid of that preload. So kind of given it by um, IV, if we can get the veins to take all that extra fluid, it takes it away from the heart. So IV is kind of what we try to do. Um, we will give pimobendin in the emergency setting. You can see we haven't given an ACE inhibitor, so we haven't given spironolactone, and sometimes we don't even give those until a week later, once we're happy that we're over the acute phase. They're the kind of, the, they're the long-term players. They don't need to go in at the very, very beginning. If it's a week later, there's no trouble with that. Um, and then we do use glycerol trinitrate. So we do give um, nitroglycerine. And this, so this is a question for Alex. So how often do you use um, glycerol trinitrate across in Hampstead? Okay, I don't. So <coughs> one of the things... Yeah. So one of the, th there is not good evidence for using nitroglycerine. If you look at kind of the evidence in people, it's tenuous. Um, in animals, it's also tenuous. In fact, I don't think there's very much about nitroglycerine in animals. Um, and so it purely comes down to anecdotal, anecdotal response to treatment. So cavaliers, um, so cavaliers for me, um, so sodium nitroglyceride, you'd be given that as a, as a CRI. Um, a, a nitroglycerine is a patch you can put in the ear or a lotion that you can put in the ear. So it depends on your level of ability to kind of monitor these patients and treat them. Um, so if you don't have access to kind of concentrated infusions, it would be a consideration to use those patches. And I think um, the patients that we see it work very well in are the cats with really bad pulmonary edema. Uh, we see it work very well for the cavaliers. Um, I probably think that's the two that we would use it in, those kind of really severe pulmonary edemas that just don't respond to, to kind of the initial treatment alone. Um, and if you have access to kind of monitoring blood pressure, giving CRIs, then uh, you know sodium nitroprusside should be on there too. Um, so good response to therapy. Um, he kind of had the response that we expected. Um, we did have to give him a lot of frusamide, partly because he partly because he didn't have a lot of pulmonary edema, but he responded very nicely to it. So if we're thinking about stage C, now we're looking at the guideline recommendations, um, we need to kind of think about how are we going to class this dog as stage C? When do you go from being stage C, nice and comfortable and congestive heart failure, to stage D, where you have um, chronic kind of end-stage mitral valve disease? So if we're in stage C, the recommendations are that you should be on all four of the treatments. If you have a dog with congestive heart failure, secondary to mitral valve, should be on fruise, should be on pimobendin, ACE inhibitor, and spironolactone. Um, and Previously, we used to kind of use a figure of you giving over 12 mg per kg per day. So there used to be a much more higher tolerance to say that you're still called, you were still considered non-refractory um, as long as you were below 12. But that's actually been brought down. If you're on over 8 mg per kg, uh, then you're now considered to be in stage D, and we need to kind of maybe up the ante and up the therapy that you're on. Um, Omega-3 fish oils. Um, so this is a recommendation. Um, if you have an anorexic or cachexic animal, or they have arrhythmias with their um, with the mitral valve disease and heart failure, consider omega-3 fish oils, uh, and then manage those kind of adjunctive things as and when required. Manage them for cough, high blood pressure, whether that's pressure um, systemic or, or high pulmonary pressures as well, uh, and if they have any arrhythmias. So once Jasper went into heart failure, we ended up with more and more problems with Jasper. Um, more lethargic. So a month later, he went home, and a month later, came back um, lethargic to Kipnik again. He'd had his doses increased at the referring vets before he came to see us. Heart rate was 160 now, um, and he was much quieter. This was not a happy dog. Um, so he came in, uh, and this is him now seven years after my first picture of Jasper. Um, hopefully it will play. And so this is Jasper in our oxygen chamber, um, and this is back in Liverpool. Um, so I guess one of the worries, uh, one of the worries about oxygen cages is, is that they do get very humid and they do get very warm. Um, so I'm not a big fan of oxygen cages. They are a necessary evil, but I don't like them. Um, they um, dogs will get hot in them. Dogs, if you can't control the temperature, you can't control the humidity, then sometimes it then becomes difficult to decide: Can I take this dog out of oxygen because it's hot in there and it's to keep it because it's hot and humid? or does it need to stay in there because it's panting because it needs more oxygen? So I think it can be really difficult. So I always kind of say to our interns now that if they have a dog and it's panting like this in a kennel, uh, it was doing this at home. So take it out of the kennel. It's, it's had its treatment. We started on freeze mite. See if it's better outside the kennel. So um, you can see that we're really trying all we can. This is an ice pack. I'm trying to cool the water where our oxygen is bubbling through. Um, but kind of these, these, now in kind of ECC care, you can get temperature controlled, um, humidity controlled oxygen chambers, and they really are probably the next step in terms of oxygen therapy. 
Other options would be a buster collar, just with oxygen, oxygen rich environment. They don't give you a very high oxygen level in the local environment, so they aren't great, but they are better probably than nothing, um, but not by much. Um, and nasal prongs, um, I just don't get on, well, I, it's not that I don't get on, dogs do not usually get on very well with nasal prongs unless they're very sick. Um, so we struggle probably to keep nasal prongs in consistently enough for them to be beneficial for a patient. And so it probably maybe a little bit more, a little bit more, you can look at this lung path and say, actually, yeah, I can see that a bit more today that this dog probably is, has more signs of pulmonary edema than he did when he first came to see us. So this was when we saw him, uh, this was then seven years later. So you can see kind of the changes over the times that we saw, that we saw Jasper as well. And it's just to show you this as well. Okay. Ah, there you go, just to make it a little bit bigger so you can see it better. And the question should still be on your question pad then as well. I'm just going to fast forward to the next slide again just so I can see how we're doing. So we're up to 12. I'll give you another couple of seconds to <coughs> place your bets. So I can find the mouse. There we go. Okay. So I've got some frequent VPCs. Oh, I can't, I can't know. That's, I don't know. That's, is that? that, is that Zero? It doesn't look like it's zero. I don't know what those are. Um, just do the maths. Actually, yes. So some people, I think, have gone for Is that? Yeah, some people have gone for those. Okay. Um, just hasn't come up with the numbers. So we've got some ventricular tachycardias, atrial fibrillation, frequent VPCs, frequent SVPCs. Because when you have a rhythm like this and we don't have anything to compare it to, Brigitte's shown some lovely examples. When you've got something normal to compare abnormal to, it makes it much easier. Um, I guess what we want to look at and what is much more bit more difficult to do here is well how long what's the duration of that QRS complex so um, you know if you're thinking well could this be AF could it be ventricular tachycardia we need to know is this a normal is this a normal supraventricular complex if it is then we can take the VPCs and we can take the um, ventricular tachycardia off the table if even if it's slightly prolonged it could still be supraventricular but if it's over if it's over 0 0.08 seconds milliseconds seconds 0 0.08 seconds uh, then that is going to be consistent with it being probably ventricular rather than it being a, like a, a conduction disturbance or a prolonged QRS. So here, um, if we measured this, this comes out at about 0 0.05. So already when it's that narrow and normal's between normal's up to 0 0.06, then we can say that's supraventricular. This is a supraventricular rhythm. Um, then the next question is, well, what are we looking at here? Is it a fast or a slow rhythm? The heart rate here is at about 190. Um, the next question is, well, what's the rhythm like? Is it regular or is it irregular? So here we have some kind of what looks quite regular. This looks pretty regular here. But then it kind of breaks out into a little bit more longer R, shorter, sh longer, 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 shorter, shorter. So it's quite irregular. It's not doing anything, anything really uh, as it should do. This is atrial fibrillation. So this is a dog that has atrial fibrillation. So it's quite common that dogs that have been coasting along with management of congestive heart failure, when that atrial fibrillation develops, uh, they, they decompensate. So you rely on your atria to kind of pump about a third of your blood volume through. So you need that atrial contraction at the end of where your P wave is to squeeze that last bit of blood out. So if you lose that, if you lose that ability to squeeze out that 30% of blood, then it stays in the left atrium. And that left atrium already has high pressure. So that pressure immediately kind of backs up the lungs and you end up with patients decompensating and going into congestive heart failure. So a key thing here is that about up to 50% of dogs that have late mitral valve disease may develop atrial fibrillation. But actually the dogs that are more likely to do it are the large breed dogs. So it's much more common that we'll see this with our Labradors and our Shepherds and Collies than we might see it in the smaller dogs. Um, but you could see the size of that football um, on the DV radiograph. That was a huge heart. So it's not surprising that he developed atrial fibrillation. Um, and so Brigitte has done a lot of work um, and is still doing a lot of work into atrial fibrillation at the moment to um, basically quantify what's the best way of managing these patients. We know, uh, we know from a survival benefit that actually if we can have a home rate of less than 125 beats per minute, that these dogs are going to live considerably longer than if you, if you have a faster heart rate. So the closer these heart rates are to physiological heart rates when they're not in heart failure, the better these dogs are going to do. So um, we will often um, be quite aggressive with rate control. Uh, we'll have them on both digoxin and diltiazem. I think for me, if the heart rate's under 160, then I might try one and then add the other if I need to. But if the heart rates are over 180, then definitely all those dogs go on to both. Between 160 and 180, I think it depends a little bit on the dog's clinical status, blood pressure, kind of all the things that we should kind of take hand in hand when we assess arrhythmias. Um, 
And then there's a question mark about, actually, maybe we can improve the... Um, when you have atrial fibrillation, you get lots of <coughs> cellular destruction going on. So um, Brigitte's doing a PhD in atrial fibrillation, so for me to just say it in destruction of cells is probably not the best way of saying it. But um, basically that's what happens. These cells do not like atrial fibrillation. <coughs> they remodel, they adapt, but they maladapt, and they end up causing more and more problems, more and more retention of, of, kind of, the, um, of calcium, and they end, up, they end up causing issues for themselves. So kind of almost shoots themselves in the foot. Um, and if you give things to kind of reduce or slow fibrosis in remodeling, that can be beneficial. It's been shown to be beneficial in people. Um, so our last one is, well, what do we do with these stage D dogs um, and the advancing congestive heart failure case? So when they move to stage D, uh, we call them advanced. Uh, they are our end stage group. And we may consider putting them onto terazamide. We may consider putting them onto comilazide, so hydrochlorothiazide and milleride, which is moderate. Um, we may sort of, if they've got decent blood pressure, we actually might try and reduce the mitral regurge um, by giving them uh, drugs to drop their blood pressure. So I think if you've got a stage D dog, I think those probably are the dogs where you probably then do want to have some input from a cardiologist. I think until they're close up to stage C, I think that that can be managed really well, um, really well in practice. But the Ds, uh, we start to get to where we're looking for things that either you have to kind of be happy with doing advanced echo to look for things like pulmonary hypertension, um, or happy to be given drugs that are going to really reduce blood pressure or um, may cause really bad kidney kidney disease as well. So just kind of, um, they're probably the dogs I think that we uh, that we um, often end up treating are these later stage ones. Um, and not to, not to forget that sometimes you've treated the heart failure, they're as dry as a whistle, um, but actually they're still coughing. And just to remember that it might be they need some airway, airway treatments too. Um, and, I, yeah, and when they get to stage D, um, it's not unreasonable to consider that these dogs are not, not long for this world. Um, and that's all true, except for uh, that we now have a new treatment option. Um, and so currently in the UK, uh, the only place that's offering this is the Royal Veterinary College, um, and that is a mitral valve repair. Um, and it is head and shoulders above treating a dog medically. Um, it's also head and shoulders above the cost of treating a dog medically as well. Um, but it gives you the best long-term prognosis, better than we can ever afford to give with medical therapy. Um, essentially what they go in and do is they tighten up your mitral valve annulus. So you've got this big stretch left atrium that stretched your mitral valve annulus, but they bring that back in again with, um, with, with sutures and pledgets um, and a, a ring, like a ring around here as well. And any broken cordy tendony are replaced with prosthetic cordy tendony. So you're basically re-aligning um, the geometry of that valve that's been stretched over time. Um, and the success rates of this are humongous. Um, this is, I love this, this is like almost like propaganda. Put your worst patient on to prove how good your surgery can be. Um, but this, I think this is still the same dog. I kind of always have to look, I think it probably is the same dog. Um, but um, there, is, there are great success reports with this. So success of surgery currently at the RVC is over 95%. Um, when we first start to send to dogs, there's this big learning curve. This is a new surgery, this is bypass surgery. It's, uh, you know, there's about, I'm, Dave, how many people are in the room for this yeah. surgery? Yeah, um, so like 15 people in a room, um, all looking after this dog from various aspects. You've got cardiologists, surgeons, anaesthetists, students, news press, lots of people. Um, but these dogs do these dogs actually do much better with this management. So I have sent a few cases um, from uh, from my practice to to, to the RVC, um, and these dogs have gone from being stage C and D, so that really kind of late. Late, late stage, and they're now back to stage B1, B2. So you almost reset the clock. Um, so I said to you that once a dog goes to stage C and D, they don't go back. The exception is that with therapy like this, where you can shrink the heart with surgery, uh, and this is the treatment of care for a person, and they would do this for you before you got to stage C, uh, that's the recommended time to do it for a person, then that is the best long-term outcome. Um, the only issue with it is that we have a price tag of about eighteen thousand pounds at the moment for the surgery. So that's kind of the big that's the big hurdle. But um, it's a big list of no. Here it is. Um, we have clients that like to do it three or four times a day. So you get these like four in a day type thing when they're really worried. But it's very handy. So here we've got a patient. Uh, this patient went in back into congestive heart failure on this day. We increased the freeze mic, and you can see that it got better for a while. Um, here we've got the eighth of June, eighteenth of. Uh, July, I think that's going to be, um, and it did better, but then it kind of got worse again. So we actually use these for the owners to titrate the doses of freezamide at home. So we give them kind of strict criteria to use, um, but they can actually manage these patients at home. And I would much rather a dog stays at home and is managed at home than it comes into hospital. And particularly true of cats. I think managing cats with heart failure, they are much better at home than they are in the clinic. So as soon as a cat is stable enough to go home, I'd rather they're at home because um, stress plays a big part in management of heart failure of cats too. So um, using respiratory rate diaries, using graphs like this can actually be useful too. So it's just the last little thing there. Um, 
Brigitte and I are going to be around. I think they kind of have to tidy the room up, so we probably will be out in the foyer out there. But first, just to say thank you very much for everybody for coming. Um, I will take any questions that anybody has. So will Brigitte. Um, we're here. We're here for a little while longer. Um, and um, if you have any cases for us, if you have any um, cases that you'd like to discuss with us, um, then please feel free to call us at London Vet Specialists, um, or also at Willows, which is where we moonlight as well. Um, and. Um, for those of you that haven't got any questions and are heading off, um, thank you very much and safe travels home and good night. <laughs> high gains, sorry, high risk, but also high reward for the patients. Um, you can get them off almost all of their medications in very successful cases. And would you say stage C is the appropriate time? It is at the moment. So there's been lots of studies um, looking at when is the most appropriate time to do it. Um, and they've looked at dogs with stage B1, B2, and C and D. Um, stage D dogs have a slightly lower um, success rate, um, probably because they're late stage and they probably have a lot of dilation of the heart. Stage C um, and late B2 are actually kind of the best for the person that invented the procedure. So he's sort of now recommending late B2 um, or just as they're about to go into congestive heart failure. Um, the RVC are waiting until they're in stage C at the moment, but that probably will come forward as time goes by and the data comes to support doing it a bit earlier, I think. Yeah, so the surgery is £18,000. Um, they do, um, I think when the programme first started, they were doing about one a week. Um, and they now kind of think have funding and uh, staff for doing up to three a week. Um, it's just come in as well. So uh, a lot of dogs currently come in from the States to have the procedure done. Um, there's no one in the States doing this at the moment. Um, so dogs get flown in from all over the world for this particular procedure. Um, and so there's kind of a possibility for about 150 dogs a year um, at the RBC. That's the capacity at the moment, but they've been doing about 50 a year so far. Good question. I don't know. I don't, I don't know is the honest answer. I don't think it does. I don't think that it does. I don't think it covers like the follow-up. Um, actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure it doesn't because I've seen some patients back and um, fought some of their follow-up. Yeah. They, they rarely end up back in surgery. We used to do one or two unranked and now it's one or two a week. Mm -hmm. They have two fellowships, so they have a fusionist and a cardiac surgeon that are doing specifically just that now at the RBC, which got in the case three years ago. Um, so they have to work with delegates doing that three weeks for us, so we have a good time there. Yeah, so as well as having high numbers, also having those high numbers actually improves the success rate. So if I, if I sent a dog for surgery now, it would do better than it would have done three years ago, just with the experience of the surgeons and the team that are doing the procedure. So I'm gonna leave this one up because I'm aware that we're running short on time. Um, really, the most important thing to remember is that there is this long disease course um, that um, mitral valve disease, when it's a grade two or three murmur, um, we probably have time on our side. Uh, you know, there's time to treat this dog, trying to investigate things. It's coughing with a grade two murmur, it probably is not in heart failure. Um, and um, that this um, respiratory rate graphs are really handy as well. So we often, if we see a patient through an LVS, we'll send them home with a respiratory rate diary. Um, they can also do it online with laps, and these are fantastic for us. Um, so we will get this, we'll get these from clients every so often. Um, took the slide out actually that is easy if we're thinking about coughing um, then we're really thinking that a coughing dog is going to be airway before it's cardiac disease um, and so just because a dog has a murmur and a cough as we said earlier on doesn't mean it's in heart failure and it's probably not the reason to start treatment and I guess I, we put here that radiographs are the gold standard for these patients and I think that's still the case but I do think that lung ultrasound is as good um, if you have a big heart you have a big left atrium you have a dog that has the clinical signs um, and there are B lines, you can see that there's fluid within the lung tissue. I think that is a reasonable approach to start treatment for those as well. Um, and this, they responded to freeze mind, so they were, they were in heart failure when we started treatment, is not always true. Um, so just remember that it does have airway effects as well. So when, they, when these dogs come in, when they, have, when they come in, they've got mitral valve disease, they're still coughing, and we're thinking, well, how are we going to manage them? Um, we've got to remember that there's lots of different reasons these dogs might be coughing. Um, so they may have concurrent tracheobronchial disease. Um, they may have a really big left atrium that's pushing up on the bronchus and causing um, compression of the main stem bronchus. Uh, there are conflicting reports as to whether that's really a thing, whether that really does happen, and whether it really causes coughing or not. Um, and then we have this association um, that hasn't been proven. So cough and heart failure together 
are not proven as, as there's, there's not a proven causal link between the two that's for mitral valve disease. So don't always put them both hand in hand. That cough, coughing, coughing doesn't always equal congestive heart failure. Um, but when we do see coughing with congestive heart failure, it has to be when these, when these lungs are totally flooded with pulmonary edema. Um, so we will see it in, the most common breed that I guess we'll see that in is the Doberman. Your Doberman that comes in that's coughing um, gets treated potentially for kennel cough because uh, it's, it's really prevalent. Um, but these dogs um, come back because they're, they're not getting better. And actually one of the first presenting signs of a Doberman with um, congestive heart failure is probably coughing um, or arrhythmias. Um, those would be the two common things that you'll see with them, sometimes before you even hear a murmur. Um, so coughing Doberman, um, always have that index of suspicion that it could be cardiogenic. Um, um, the prevalence of DCM in Dobies is about 50, 58% in Germany um, and seeing as that there's not many lines of Dobermans, it's not probably far off that for the UK either. So. I said that there was this kind of, they're not, there's not really good evidence whether or not dogs get um, bronchial compression from a big left atrium. Uh, and here's a case that I saw to kind of prove the point that actually, yes, they do sometimes. So this is uh, the airway to begin with. Uh, this is when we, tip, we kind of um, irritated the airway, made this dog a little bit light. And you can actually see what um, we've got here is a bit of the mucosa, and we've got this really rough, irregular area to the mucosa. When this dog coughs, we get compression, and literally underneath here is the left atrium. So this dog has had chronic, the two airways have been hitting one another, and it's developed this reaction, um, and this is right over the left atrium. You can see uh, how kind of compressed that bronchus gets as well. This is a really difficult thing to manage, so we kind of have to give, we gave this dog bronchodilators, uh, about 50% response rate to bronchodilators. We gave the dog codeine, uh, there is a uh, I think they're probably about a 25% response to codeine when they've got bronchial compression like this from the left atrium. So they are really challenging cases and you don't always get on top of the cough. Cough sometimes is something that you end up having to having to live with if the dog isn't in congestive heart failure. Trouble with it? No, everyone's happy. So Chris will speak, um, take over for the second half of the evening now. Chris graduated and did his um, cardiology training at Liverpool University. Um, and he's going to talk to us about some clinical cases of mitral valve disease and um, what, when and why. Thanks so much, Dave. So hopefully this works. Uh, the last time that I tried to get this working here in this building it was a bit of a nightmare. Um, so it's hopefully going to be interactive and there's a few questions, kind of just to gauge the opinion, what the poll is of the audience, um, but also then to kind of work through some of the questions and some of the cases that we're going to show you as well. Um, so if you don't have the app, you can still play along. Um, you can also play along if you just want to use your internet browser too.